Hi, my name is Jeff Boggs, and I welcome you to the first week of Geography and Tourism Studies TP21 Introduction to Research Design and Methodology. Why take this course? Are you taking this course because you wish to prepare for Geography and Tourism Studies 3P56 or 3P57, sometimes known as our Peterborough Field Course? Or are you taking it for Geography and Tourism Studies 3P21, our Qualitative Methods and Research Design course? Or are you taking it for 3P22, our Quantitative uh, Research Design and Methodology course? That's certainly one reason. Another might be you just have an intrinsic desire to learn about the basics of research design. And a third reason might be that you want to write a research proposal to prepare you to do field work in Peterborough when you take Geography or Tourism Studies 3P56 or 3P57. I would argue that you're taking this course for all three reasons. And to help you understand how this course sequences with the other courses in our program, I've got a little slide. So we have Geography or Tourism Studies 2P21. So this is Introduction to Research Design and Methodology. And this feeds into, this prepares you for three other courses, three other mandatory courses, at least once Two of them are mandatory. I think the third one is only mandatory in some cases. So one of the mandatory courses is Geography and Tourism Studies, either 3P56 or 3P57, in which you will travel to Peterborough, Ontario, and conduct over three days field work, either in the city of Peterborough or if you are a physical geographer outside of the city of Peterborough. So it'll help prepare you for that course by helping you think about what it even means to design research, uh, but also because in this course you will write a proposal that you can then modify, update for use in 3P56 and 3P57. Also prepares you for Geography and Tourism Studies 3P21, which is Introduction to uh, Qualitative Research Design and Methodology, uh, in which you focus on a particular suite of techniques for collecting and analyzing qualitative data. And then it also prepares you to think about research design in terms of geography and tourism studies 3p22 which is our course on a suite of techniques that some people would refer to as kind of statistics but are statistics that are uh, focused on hypothesis testing if you will testing testing one two three Testing, testing, one, two, three. So by this point, if you are a reasonable student, you'll be asking, how are you marked? Well, 10% of your mark is based on a weekly online quiz that is designed to ensure that you read the textbook and hopefully learn from it. Another 20% are weekly critic assignments. And so critic is an online system uh, that you'll have to subscribe to. I'll provide information for that under a different video. And critic is actually the only thing that you absolutely must buy this semester. And it should be $20 plus tax, uh, but I'll have some more about that. And the way critic works is that you'll be asked a series of questions, you'll answer those questions, and then you will receive feedback on those on your answers to those questions. 
using a rubric that was already provided with the assignment when you first began it. And then you will provide feedback on the feedback that you received. So some of this feedback will come from myself and or the TA, and some of it will come from your colleagues. And so your mark for this assignment is sort of for each week, there will be a kind of a couple of three different components. And we'll have a video where we go into a bit more depth about that. So in sort of the, the benefits of Critic. Okay, so, so far, this 10% for weekly online quizzes and this 20% from the weekly critic assignment, these are essentially taking up um, some of the slack from seminars. And so things that you would have done in seminar are being captured in these assignments. You then have three more major assignments for the course. And the first is to write an annotated bibliography that has at least eight cita or sort of eight entries in it. And we'll have some lectures where we talk about how to go about this. And that will be 10% of your total mark. And then the material in your annotated bibliography is then used to write first a literature review, which will be 20% of your total marks. And then this literature review informs a research proposal that you will write uh, at the end of the course. And so these last three assignments in particular mirror in a somewhat, somewhat more elongated fashion. So basically you have more time to do these than you would in 3P56 and 3P57. So it's sort of getting you up to speed for that assignment. So, and the instructions for these three assignments should be found under the resources tab on the course webpage. So there is no mandatory forum, lecture, seminar, or office hours participation. So if you have no questions, that's totally fine. I'm not sure if I would recommend that, but I, I'm not going to punish people for uh, lack of participation in other forums. I think that I've already got enough material here to mark you on and to sort of move you along towards the end goal of writing a competent research proposal. So I know other classes will probably have you do group activities. I'm not going to do that. Okay, I, I suppose aside from the weekly critic assignments. So in that you'll be marking some of your colleagues work. Uh, so I guess there is a bit of participation there, but you are not required to write anything in the forum or come to office hours, anything like that if you don't want to. Okay. And the textbook is Research Basics, Design to Data Analysis in Six Steps by James Spickard. And it is published or was published in 2017. The Brock Bookstore should still have some copies. So you can certainly purchase it there in hard or in soft cover if you wish. I believe there is also a digital version that you can access or purchase through the Brock Bookstore. And then finally, and this I've only recently learned about, is that the Brock Library has digital copies of this book as well, and that evidently you can download chapters as PDF files. So if you are looking to save money, that might be one approach that you take is to make use of the uh, PDF files that Brock Library has listed sort of under their bibliographical entry for this book. And the link for that is on the uh, fiddlesticks. It is on this sort of, I believe I called it the overview page in Sakai. So you kind of scroll down a bit 
and you'll have a gander at that. And when you get to this section, that says something along the lines of uh, things that you need to purchase for this course. Originally, this was one of those things, but I found out it's actually available through the Brock Library. Now, I don't know if that means that 40 people can all access at once this textbook or if only one person at a time can access it. So I would recommend that you access it as soon as possible and download the files that you need from it, which would be all of them. So I picked this book because it discusses uh, research design to data analysis in six steps. So a lot of other books will sort of break this into three steps, but I find that having actually more steps, and in particular Spickard's, the author here, that his six steps are actually quite useful. So I would uh, recommend that you read the textbook and, you know, however you get a hold of it. Okay. So like most students and most reasonable people encountering something new, you're probably going to have questions. Normally during a lecture in which I stood in front of the course or we had a seminar and we were all sitting around a table, you could just raise your hand and ask a question. That doesn't work so well in this format. So instead what you're going to do is as you have questions, you're going to post them in the week one forum if they're for week one. And as you have questions about week two, you'll post those in the week two forum and so on. I would like before you post questions to for you to have read, especially questions about material in the lecture slides, is for you to have read the corresponding chapter or chapters in the textbook because it might be that that helps answer some of your questions or it might be that those create even more questions for you but whatever the case you know look around a little bit first and then if you still have questions post in the forum at this point we would usually be somewhere between i don't know 15 and 40 minutes into a lecture Currently, we are about 12 minutes in, or 13 minutes into a lecture. And what would happen at that point is that I would post a question sort of like this one. So kind of an ice-breaking question that gets at the core or the central concern or justification for why we even bother to offer this course. And in this case, you're taking a course 2P21, that is, is a course on research design. And then after we talked a bit about what you thought of when you heard the phrase research design, we would talk a bit about why do you think those things, like what conjures this up, right? So you hear the term research design and maybe something pops into your mind and we can talk about those connections because often those kinds of connections are fruitful or useful ways to build on what you already know. So we have research design. Hold on, let me try to write this here. So we have research design and what does that mean right and so to a lot of people let's maybe start with design first so if we start with design To a lot of people, the word design suggests a kind of maybe a plan 
or a blueprint. or instructions, if you will, for doing something. And so when we think in terms of research design, we're thinking about a, a plan or a set of blueprints or instructions for conducting research. And as you progress through this course, you want to think about the things that you're learning and how they relate back to research. And in particular, a thing that happens with research is that you tend to conduct it uh, by doing one thing first and then something else. So this plan, if we think in terms of plans again, This plan will have steps, right? And for Spickard, there are six steps. And as you're reading the textbook, you also want to think, and as you're reading the material on the course Sakai page, you want to think about what steps are you working through as you're doing whatever it is that you're doing? And so Spickard lays out six steps for conducting research. And so the way that each of those steps uh, sort of unfolds depends upon the nature of what it is that you're researching, but there still are six steps. Okay, so we've kind of talked about what we mean by design when we say research design. And we now have a better sense that design suggests that there's a plan or blueprint or instructions. Let's turn now to this notion of research. No, oh, fiddlesticks. You have to forgive me. I've owned this tablet for about 10 years, and this is the first time I've actually really sat down and forced myself to use it. So still using a drawing tablet is much easier than using a mouse to write things. Okay, so research sometimes is a thing to people. So they might say that, no, oh, fiddlesticks, hold on. Actually, let me use a different color. Use red here. So the research, some people think of it as kind of a thing or, if you will, the results of some kind of process. So research is sometimes thought of as a thing or the results. So you know, one of the results of research into I suppose online course design is that I am attempting to use some of the techniques which are alleged to be more effective in helping students learn in an online course, right? So that there are results that I am making use of. However, research, we can also think of research as a kind of a process, you know, fiddlesticks, as a process, right? So it is something that we do, and in particular, it's a process to, that we follow to answer a question. So research, we can think of it as a thing or results. So that's one way to think about research, but another way let me just go up here. So I'll put a, a one up here. So that's one way to think about research is that it's sort of the end result of some process, but it's also a process to answer a question. 
And so research design involves coming up with a plan for a process to answer a question that then produces results that are hopefully usable by someone. With that in mind, we can define research design as a systematic, transparent, and reproducible plan for conducting research. That is, collecting data and analyzing it in order to answer a research question. So research design, the purpose of it is to answer a research question. And it's not just answered in sort of a helter-skelter or pell-mell format, but it's, it's answered systematically and transparently and reproducibly. So by systematic, that means that there are steps. By transparent, it means that it's relatively clear what is happening in each of those steps. And by reproducible, that means that someone else could take your research design, follow it, and come up with an answer to the same research question that probably uh, would be somewhat similar to what you found, right? So this notion of reproducible, that's important because it may very well be that, you know, in five years after conducting your research, you want to do it again and see if things have changed. So by having a systematic and transparent plan, that means that you have steps and that you are clear about what those steps are. And frequently, who am I kidding? Always, that means that you have written these down. That then makes it reproducible for people who have a general sense about the thing that you are interested in studying for them to follow that again. And to be clear, the premise of Spickard's book, that is your textbook, is that good research follows a six step plan. And we will go through these steps as the weeks progress and you will use these steps to write your proposal and to help you understand why I am having you write an annotated bibliography and why you are turning that into a literature review as two other assignments. So at this point, you're probably asking, oh, dear God, please just give me these steps and shut up. All right. What I will do is provide you now a Spickard six steps. So the first is develop a good research question. A lot of times in this course, I will write the word RQ, or I guess the letters RQ. Let me move this up over here. Yep, so RQ, research question. So the first thing you want to do is develop a good research question and a, we have additional material on the week one Sakai page, and actually a bit on the week two as well, uh, that helps you begin to arrive at a good research question. So his second step, oh, fiddlesticks, hold on. Let me erase that, there, okay. Then his second step is to choose a corresponding logical structure. Now, Spickard is honestly the only textbook that I've seen that even talks about logical structures in the way that he does, or that even uses this term when they're talking about research design. However, it's actually a fairly clever way to come up with the typology of different ways to go about doing research. So, it could have more detail in my mind. And he's written this book 
for an audience of social scientists largely. So I would argue that he might benefit from including a bit more about uh, research that relies on observational data from the natural world, though he actually does include some stuff on that. I think he has a chapter where he talks a bit about California condors and some other kinds of animals. So some material that's a bit like bio, biogeography or biogeography adjacent. Um, but if we come back to this notion of this logical structure, there are some number of those, I'm going to say about 10, and we'll go over those. But once you have a research question, then you think about what's the best way to go about answering. That and that's where the logical structure comes in. OK, and then after that, oh, fiddlesticks, hold on. Yeah, there are 10 logical structures, right? And we'll cover those next week. And what I actually find is that in 3P56 and 3P57, so that's the Peterborough course, that there's a limited number of these that people actually make use of. So partially because you're collecting your own data and not relying on secondary data, uh, but there's a couple of other reasons as well for that, but we'll talk about that more next week. So Speckard's, Spickard's six steps, so the third of his six steps is you identify the type of data that you need. So this, I want to say, if I think about it, that there are 14 types of data my recommendation is that when you're writing your research proposal, that you're you're really going to think about one kind of data that you need to answer that question. So you could use many kinds of data. You don't need to. We want to focus. So and in around week three, we'll start talking about that. Uh, the, what he means by types of data. He then talks about a data collection method. So this data collection method, and it's a collection method. So a lot of other books would start talking about things like sampling at this time. How are you going to pick, uh, or yeah, how are you going to pick, the fancy term would be elements from a population to, uh, to analyze. So if you were interested in the effects of stream runoff on fish, then you would probably want to collect some fish, for instance, and maybe some kind of measurement on stream runoff as well. Like, so what is the amount? What kind of chemicals does it contain in it? Uh, things like that, right? So but data collection, uh, he has, if I remember correctly, We'll see here in a minute. I believe sort of 12 general ways to think about data collection. Yeah, 12. And around week four, we'll get into those. And so we've got our research question. We have a logical structure. So we know what our big question is, and we think about what would be the best way to answer it. That's kind of where our logical structure comes in. Once we have a particular logical structure, there are only some kinds of data that fit with that logical structure. So after you have identified your logical structure, then you figure out what type of data do you need. And then after you figure out what kind of data you need, only then do you think about how am I actually going to get my hot little hands on that data? So that's when you start to think about the data collection method. So I noticed that a lot of books kind of skip over steps two and three and sort of jump right to four. So I find having steps two and three really useful because it slows you down and forces you to think through what you're doing so that when you get out to the field, you don't collect a bunch of data that you can't actually then 
use. So your fifth step is that once you figured out how you want to collect your data, then you figure out the site and your sampling strategy. So the site is the actual location. So the site is the actual location or the place where you might get that data. And so it, it could be that if you were interested in the effects of uh, pollution runoff on fish, that you could compare two different places, one that has that has lots of runoff and one that doesn't. Or it could also be that perhaps Parks Canada already has lots of data stuffed in a filing cabinet. Well, I guess nowadays it would be all digital, but perhaps someone has secondary data in an office somewhere that would also let you answer your questions. So what's interesting about Spickard is that for sites, these can be places where you physically go and collect your data. So Peterborough is one example, but they can also be places that sort of hold your data. And so in the cases where you're going to collect what's called primary data, that's data that you collect or people under your immediate control collect, that uh, usually requires that you go out into the field or you interact with the world in some way often some painstaking way to collect your data. Sometimes though, there are things like, uh, well, the census in Canada, for instance, is housed at Statistics Canada, and they make a fair amount of that data available. So it could be that if you're gonna rely on data from Statistics Canada, which is a, an example of secondary data, that your site might actually be a website, right? So you're not going to use a website for Peterborough, but uh, when you go collect your data, but this is to give you a notion of how flexible this idea of site is in Spickard's mind. And then he'll come up with a sampling strategy. And so lots of, of textbooks on research design will have many chapters on this sort of stuff. So if you've had a course before where it's been on it's been about research design. This bit here actually might be something you've encountered before. But you know, the point here is, do you rely on a random sample or a non-random sample? And if it's random, what kind of a random sample? And if it's non-random, what kind of non-random sample? And then his last step is that you pick a data analysis method We have now introduced the six steps of Spickard. And just to give you a sense of how they all fit together, and one way to think about those are that as you make your first decision, that is, as you decide on what your research question is, that then will lead to another question of how am I going to answer that research question? That gets back to his notion of logical structure, that is his second step. And then from there, he moves on to ask, what kind of data do I need to answer this research question, given that I'm using this particular logical structure? It, it, that's your third step. And as he moves through this, what tends to happen is that you will find yourself with fewer and fewer decisions to make, which is actually kind of nice, as you work through his six steps. With that in mind, it, it's really important to think about what is a research question. And so a research question tends to, according to Spickard, now I don't totally agree with this, but I'll go along with it for the sake of this course, is that he argues that research questions, so RQs, right? That they answer one of three questions. So the first is a, what he calls a how question. So they tell us how something works. So you know, how does uh, a toxic 
oil spill, affect tourism in an island uh, community dominated by tourism? That's a bit of a, a wordy question, and it's actually a bit vague. It could be focused in a lot more, but that might be one example of a how question. Or how does uh, rain shape the formation of coastlines? That might be a physical geography question, right? So but how questions, they tell us, or if we get an answer to a how question, they tell us how something works. So how do avalanches happen in heavily deforested mountain regions, for instance? Another kind of question are what he calls what questions. He argues these describe people's thoughts. I'm not sure if I completely buy that, but we'll go with it for now. So what do tourists visiting heavily deforested regions think about the deforested mountain landscape? So in this case, we've got a question in which it's about if you will, the interaction between tourists and heavily deforested regions. And how do tourists perceive these heavily deforested regions in a particular def deforested mountain landscapes? His last question, which drives me crazy because it's not really a question, Questions in English, you may recall, start with, often with W. So where, so where do tsunamis start or why? Why do we benefit from trade or how? That's sort of an, ex an exception, but there's what. There's when, when did the tsunami, uh, sorry, when did the tsunami uh, strike a particular location? That's a fairly kind of factual question, but it is a kind of a question. So where, why, when, who? So who tends to benefit from tourism development in areas that have experienced heavy levels of deforestation might be a, a, a who question. Uh, so normally in English, these kinds of words, the fancy term is interrogative. These interrogatives uh, are, are question words. And then here we have do, which drives me crazy because it's not really a question word. Nonetheless, Spickard's going to use it and he says that do questions ask about people's behaviors. So do tourists tend to visit heavily deforested mountain regions more after an avalanche or before? Which uh, I would have converted that into a why question. So why do tourists tend to visit heavily deforested mountain regions more after an avalanche than before, or vice versa, but there it is. All right. And at this point, you are probably asking, how do I find a research question? You'll have some activities during week one and onwards that will help you begin to identify research questions, but before we do that, I want you to think of a research question as kind of the sharp point of a pyramid, if you will. Here's my little pyramid, an upside down pyramid. And so the research question is here on the bottom, right? Research question. And at the very top of this is a research problem. So sometimes in my notes, I will call these an RP. 
And this is a fairly broad area of interest. And by area, I don't mean location as much as like a theme. So one example, keeping with the ones that I've shown on previous slides are, oh, well, hold on, we'll work through that in the next slide. So a point here is that for reasons that don't totally make sense to me, Spicker doesn't bother to tell us anything about this. He does not include this step. So think of this as a really broad area of interest, and we'll have some examples in following slides. This is then followed by something that he does talk about, a research topic. And there are textbooks that will use these terms interchangeably. For our purposes, let's think about research problems as vague. V A G U E. I mean, that might actually, the U might be in the wrong place, not positive. So, but the most vague is a research problem. Uh, a research topic is less vague nope. there I'm beginning to write like a seven-year-old okay so a research topic is less vague. Sometimes I'll call that an RT. So I'll put a little RT. And then the last bit is a research question. So you will often start with one or more research problems. And within those, you'll start to identify somewhat less vague things that you're interested in. We can call these research topics. And then from each of those research topics, you'll usually come up with one or more research questions. So let's, we'll call research questions specific or the most specific. That's S-P-E-C-I-F-I-C. -I -I Sorry if it looks a bit funky. So in the week one Sakai material, I sort of beat this like a dead horse. I guess that's a terrible thing to say. You should never beat a living or a dead horse. So I cover these topics with a fair number of examples uh, in the week one and maybe the week two material. Uh, on Sakai, but you start at the top with something, a research problem, something you're interested in, and then you start to winnow it down until eventually you come up with one or more research questions. And for the purpose of your proposal that you'll write for this course, I implore you, I beg you just to focus on one research question. It makes things much easier and allows you to concentrate your effort in a very productive way. Summarizing what I've just said, we refine a research question from a research problem and a research topic. So as we do that, we're moving from the general to the specific, right? So we're moving as we do this, as we move from the research proposal to the research topic to the research question, we're moving from the general to the specific. So we have our research problem. That's something that we're broadly interested in, but part of what makes a research plan or a research proposal good is it being focused because honestly you cannot answer everything. 
So from your broad research problem, you start to identify narrower research topics. And then eventually you sort of zero in on one of these topics and come up with a research question. So that's what I mean is in saying that there's a movement from the general. So up over here, so this is the general to the less uh, general, to the less vague, to the more specific, to the very specific or the very focused here at the bottom. Reiterating a point that I've made these past few slides, remember that research problems precede research topics. So research problems are really general. Research topics are somewhat less general. And again, Spicker does not talk about research problems, sadly. A research problem, for our purposes, we can think of this as it's something that identifies some items of interest, often but not always as vague claims. Sometimes they're just fragments of a claim or fragments of a sentence, if you will. So some examples might be avalanches transform landscapes. So maybe you think avalanches are really cool. That counts as the beginning of a research problem. So if you have a hankering, a sort of a undying love of, of avalanches and how they work their way across a landscape to alter how it changes, either in the short term or the long term, that would be a completely reasonable research problem. It might be that you've noticed that avalanche tourism is a growing activity. I actually don't know if avalanche tourism is a thing at all. It seems like a, a very sad form of what in English sometimes gets called rubbernecking. So when people stop and look at gruesome accidents at the side of the road, but nonetheless, I can imagine that in a world of more than 7 billion people, there are probably at least two or three people who would like to go to a place that's had an avalanche after, uh, just to see what happened. And they're not doing it for sort of uh, public planning reasons, but because of some vicarious interest in death and destruction. So maybe this is an example of what in tourism studies might get called dark tourism. In any case, this could be thought of as a, a research problem. Another research problem might be that people don't behave rationally in dangerous landscapes. So it might very well be that people live in an area in which avalanches are quite common every 10 or 15 or 20 years, and they could move somewhere else, but for whatever reason they don't, or maybe they can't move somewhere else. That's even more terrifying. It, and it might be that you're interested in why otherwise seemingly sane people continue to live in a, a dangerous landscape that, for instance, might have lots of avalanches. Or you might say the same thing about people living next to volcanoes that are active, or I don't know, even people that stay behind in war-torn areas. In any case, these are sort of a that, that, and that are all examples of research problems. And they're useful because they help you start to think about what you need to read to see what has already been written about these areas or these topics. In Spickard's mind, certainly in this textbook that he's written, research topics are general questions. So they're not, they're not claims. They're not sort of fragments of a sentence. They are a particular kind of question. So for instance, how do avalanches transform landscapes? That is what he is referring to as a research topic. I've actually seen textbooks, not textbooks, 
I've had advisors and I've actually seen books as well that would argue that this is a sort of a, a high level research question. So how do avalanches tran transform landscapes? So it's asking questions about the process of how does an avalanche transform a landscape? For Spickard, and we'll see that in the next slide, he prefers research questions to be even more focused than this. So let's look at a different example. When do avalanches transform landscapes would be, in Spickard's terms, another research topic. When did avalanche tourism begin, if it's such a thing? That would be an example in Spickard's mind of a research topic. Why don't people behave rationally in dangerous landscapes would be another research topic in his mind. And part of what makes this a general question is that it's talking about, in this particular instance, people. So we're also talking about rationally and we're talking about dangerous landscapes. So part of turning that into a research question would be more specifically identifying who do we mean by people? So are we talking about Sherpas in the Himalayan mountains? So these are Sherpas are people who for the last hundred years or so have had a connection to the mountain climbing community in and around Mount Everest. So that would be a very specific group of people. And then we might want to unpack or take apart or problematize what do we mean by rationally. And then also, what do we mean by dangerous landscapes? Is a landscape, I mean, all landscapes are dangerous, just some are more dangerous than others. I could, for instance, walk out in front of my house, heaven forfend, walk on the sidewalk and be run over by a drunk driver. It's probably not very likely, but it's a possibility. So we in that case, might want to think about what counts, what do we mean by dangerous when we talk about a dangerous landscape. But that would then relate to the research question that would come out of this research topic. Where is avalanche tourism most important? That might actually, it depends. That could be a research question but I would op optimally want to see that refined even more. And then the last here, who behaves rationally during an avalanche? And I've got an example that will sort of illustrate that in a moment. So according to Spickard, these kinds of questions are examples of research topics. So if you go online and you read about research topics and research questions, you might see research questions described in this more general sense. So, but we want to pay attention to what Spickard says and come up with really specific research questions. And one of the reasons we want to do that is practical or pragmatic, is that it makes our life easier because by being specific, we it makes us easier to say whether something is or isn't important. Uh, when we go to conduct our research. And it makes it easier to sort of draw, if you will, a box around what kind of data we need. So it makes it easier for us to figure out what do we and do we not need. Research questions are specific questions. So they're not general questions, they're specific questions. This is, again, Spickard's definition of research questions. And let us explore a couple of examples. So they will tend to identify specific sites or contexts. They'll also often identify, or at least hint at, processes, so what causes these to happen, and possibly even the kind of data that you would need to collect to answer that question. So this is one of the benefits of using 
Spickard's definitions of research questions is that you will typically identify your site and or context, what might be causing this thing to happen, and as well as naming explicitly the kind of data that you need to collect to answer your question. If we start with this research topic, how do avalanches transform landscapes? We could, remember, ask a couple of different research questions from this. So how do avalanches transform landscapes? So one question might be, how much did avalanches on the Matterhorn, so that is a mountain in the European Alps, so not the Dinaric Alps in Yugoslavia, but the Swiss Alps. So how much did avalanches on the Matterhorn change the surrounding watershed during the 18th century? So this is much more specific. So we're still talking about avalanches, but we've identified where they are. So they're avalanches on the Matterhorn, so a mountain in the Swiss Alps. So, so they are avalanches, so located or that have happened on the Matterhorn. So that is a mountain in the Swiss Alps in a way that gets back to this notion of site. How much did avalanches on the Matterhorn change the surrounding watershed during the 18th century. So I imagine that avalanches change lots of things. They're probably fairly brutal for forests and forest creatures. I imagine the snow cascades down through a mountainy forest and crushes all the bears and skunks, and maybe not skunks, I don't know if there's skunks in Switzerland, but all kinds of plants and animals basically get flattened by avalanches. But in this question, we're asking about the watershed around the Matterhorn. So we're asking, how did these avalanches on the Matterhorn change the surrounding watershed? And to make it even more specific, we're saying during the 18th century. So this is like basically from 1700, there's my seven, 1700 to 1799. So that has even that has focused our research even more. So this is one example of a research question that has been derived from this original research topic. How do avalanches transform landscapes? So hopefully you can see that this up here is, is general, and this down here is specific. Now, this particular research question is probably something more suitable for a graduate student or a faculty member or someone who has really deep pockets uh, or the ability to access climate data and travel to Switzerland and probably speaks German or Italian and French as well, given uh, that the languages used in Switzerland uh, may, that there may be records kept in those languages uh, that would help you understand the surrounding watershed and how it changed in response to avalanches. Uh, so that is, that's still a focused research question and it's probably too big for something like a Peterborough project, but it's still an example of a fairly focused research question. Another example of a research question that relates again to the research topic of how do avalanches transform landscapes. So remember that's the general question. Another much more specific question would be to what degree do avalanches in Alberta's Rockies since 2000 impact the local black bear population? So, whereas before we were talking about general impacts on landscapes due to avalanches, here 
we are talking about, we're still talking about avalanches, but they're avalanches in Alberta's Rockies. So that's a location. We've also identified a time. So since the year 2000, so in the last 20 or I guess 21 years technically, so we've identified a site, a time period, and then also we're focusing on one kind of organism, the local black bear population. And it might be that there are both local and non-local black bears. I don't know, maybe there are like hobo black bears that wander around all throughout Canada and across the US border. And there are other black bears that are a bit more likely to not range so far. We are interested in the black bears that tend to always be in that area, right? So this is a much more specific, much more explicit focusing of that research topic to, to make a research question. To hammer the point home, I've got two more of these slides. So remember, research questions are specific questions. Research topics are more general questions. Research problems are not even questions. They're more of a sort of a, a, something that you're kind of interested in, but you haven't really done much with that yet to focus it. This is repeated from the previous pages. However, the example is new. So when did avalanche tourism begin, assuming such a thing even exists? So that could be, I suppose somebody could write a book about that and then look at how it, it began in different locations. You're not gonna write a book for this course, so don't worry about that. But this is a research topic. When did avalanche tourism begin? So this is general. So that's general, whereas this research question, what caused avalanche tourism to begin on Mount Kilimanjaro? First, let me say that in this course, sometimes I will come up with examples that have no relation to actual things that have happened in the world. I do not know if Mount Kilimanjaro actually has avalanches, it is still, to my knowledge, snow peaked. I'm not sure how many more decades that will survive with global warming. And I can imagine that at some time in its history, there, is, there have been at least one avalanches on Mount Kilimanjaro. Whether or not there's ever been avalanche tourism there is another, is purely speculation on my part. However, with that in mind, this research question, what caused avalanche tourism to begin on Mount Kilimanjaro, is focused on a particular location. And it, if we go here, hold on, it really only differs from the previous, so from this research topic, in that it's, it's at least specifying a particular place, and that's really the only difference well, I suppose it asks what caused it be, to begin, but honestly, when and what caused in this particular context text mean kind of the same thing. Nonetheless, this is a research question that is, is, is more specific than the research topic from which it is derived. Another example might be how seasonal is avalanche tourism in North America in the 20th century? So in this in instance, we're asking a question about seasonality. in avalanche tourism. I mean, my assumption is that avalanches 
tend to take place in the winter time, maybe even in the late winter time, uh, as lots of snow has accumulated and as it's begun to melt, and then all of a sudden it comes loose. I've never had a course in avalanches, mind you, so I'm sure that physical geographers will be happy to tell me uh, how this actually works. But this notion of seasonality gets at, it relates back to this notion of when, right? So when implies some kind of time component. And it might very well be that avalanche tourism really only happens between, say, January and March in most places in North America, because that's mainly when you're going to see avalanches. And we've specified it a little more clearly here, not just by saying or asking how seasonal is avalanche tourism. So we might examine that by looking at records of the number of visitors to places that are prone to avalanches. Uh, we might also instead look at advertisements that advertise that this particular location has a high level of avalanches and that all your avalanche tourism needs could be met at that location. Uh, so this might be some data sources or kinds of data. Uh, but, but this research question is also more specific in that it's talking about where, so in North America. And we could make it even more specific by saying like uh, the Albertan Rockies or the Colorado Rockies Right, so to narrow it even more, for lack of better words, narrowly uh, to a particular location. And here we are also identifying a particular time when that is taking place. So we're not interested in anything before 1899, and we're not interested in anything after depending on how you count it, 1999 or 2000. So it's it's more specific in terms of location, the time, and even what it is about avalanche tourism. So is it seasonal? So it is, this is a more specific sort of sub-question, if you will, of this larger research topic, this more general question. Again, research questions are specific questions. Research topics are general questions. If we continue with some of the examples from before, you don't really need that. You've already seen that. So if the research topic is who behaves rationally during an avalanche, that's, that's still fairly broad. It is a question, uh, in, but it is it hasn't really defined who the who is, aside from the fact that they behave rationally during an avalanche. We could come up, so this is a, a general question, we could come up with a much more specific question that is derived from this. So. For instance, how do Sherpas prepare for avalanches? So Sherpas are a kind of who, they're a group of people in the Himalayas who work with, I'm gonna say it, idiots who climb mountains so they can stick a flag up there and prove how like totally cool they are and frequently die. Uh, but and in any case, Sherpas are the people that actually do the, the actual work of carrying all the, all the camp gear up and down the mountains. So, so that gets at both a who, so, but implicitly, this is in the Himalayas, right? So it's a particular location in the earth, and so, or on the earth. So how do Sherpas prepare for avalanches? So we might then imagine that preparing for an avalanche is a kind of rational behavior. So do you prepare for an avalanche if you live in a place where there's lots of snow and there are steep mountains you are, and you've lived there for some time and your ancestors have lived there for some time, there are probably things that people do 
to avoid being killed by avalanches and that Sherpas have probably learned some of those. So this is a question that gets at sort of the local knowledge that Sherpas have and you know what do they do to avoid uh, being killed by avalanches any more than they already are. Another research question would be to what degree does safety training for climbers reduce climbing deaths from avalanches? So in this case, one way that we might think about rationality is that people behave rationally or sensibly in the sense that they would like to preserve their life. So on the one hand, one might say anybody who goes and climbs a really steep mountain with lots of snow is not rational. But it might actually be that people that climb really steep mountains in which they have a possibility of dying, they still have some desire to live. And as a, a way to reduce their chances of dying or being left as a frozen corp for, corpse for 80 years on a Himalayan mountain, they might, for instance, uh, engage in safety training, right? So perhaps what are the signs of avalanches? They might learn about that. Are there particular things that you want to do in your camp at night to prevent avalanches? So for instance, you do not want to play loud music uh, because the sound waves or yelling can occasionally cause an avalanche to form. So it causes the snow to come loose and come crashing down. So there also might be particular ways that you tie up your rigging as you're climbing up and down mountains uh, so that you are less likely if your climbing party, if some of them are hit by an avalanche, that the rest of you might still manage to hang on to the side of the mountain, right? And so in this case, if we're not saying so much about, in this particular instance, about a location but we are being much more specific about a particular kind of activity for a particular group, so for climbers. And we could even you know, define climbers more narrowly. So it, you know, it could be professional climbers or amateur climbers, or we could replace climbers entirely with Sherpas because they also have to climb to carry all the gear for these crazy people that like to go up on mountains. Uh, so we could make this even more specific, but even as it is, it is still much more specific than the original research topic. And then a third question is that, that relates back to this research topic. What is the role of grandmothers in teaching Sherpas to recognize avalanche signs? So, this is another purely speculative question, but my suspicion is that people that, that grow up in cultures in which avalanches are fairly common probably transmit or teach information about how to recognize avalanches as well as how to survive avalanches or how to avoid avalanches, that's probably part and parcel of how people in those cultures live their life, right? So you might think it's maybe a bit similar to how, as a kid, your parents, if you grew up in North America in a, an urban or suburban area, your parents probably said, look both ways before you cross the street. And if they didn't, you certainly learned that in school. So it could very well be that there's sort of this collective common knowledge that inculcates or, or trains Sherpas from a very early age to recognize avalanche signs. And it might very well be that grandmothers are really important that, in that, especially if, for instance, the mothers of, of children in these communities go off and are migrant workers come back on the weekends and if the fathers are often climbing up in the mountains it might very well be that grandmothers end up essentially raising 
these children who then later go on to become Sherpas. So that is sort of the motivation for that kind of question. And But it is a much more specific example of, or I guess a much more specific question that relates back to the research topic. So after those three slides, I hope you have a better sense of the difference between a research topic, which is a general question, according to Spickard, and a research question, which is a very specific question, according to Spickard. I hope you have a better sense of those differences. And you may ask yourself, okay, I have a general sense for that, but how do I get from going from a, a research problem, so something I'm vaguely interested in, to a research question? topic, so a general question about something I'm interested in, to a research question that's manageable. So that is a really specific question that you can actually write a, a research proposal around. The way that you move through those steps involves you starting now, I would say, beginning to read scholarly literature about the topic that you're interested in. Often I find that I will need to look at, well, for me, it's a little bit different because I've been enmeshed in this stuff for decades. But what I've seen work for students is that often they will use, not Google, but they'll use the library system at Brock to do a literature search on and, and pull up about 15 or 20 or 30 scholarly articles, and they'll rapidly skim through those to figure out what even sounds interesting to them. And from that, then they'll end up selecting, you know, somewhere between eight and 10 articles that they'll really focus on when they are first beginning to write their annotated bibliography but then that they then use that to write their literature review that goes into their research proposal. But this is something that good students do not the night before it's done, but that they start now at the beginning of the semester. So for the first week of class, your critic assignment is designed to force you to start thinking about research problems, research topics, and research questions that interest you. Because you are going to write a research proposal. Uh, so you're going to develop a plan to answer a research question that is somehow related to the fine city of Peterborough, and uh, that you will go and collect data for next year or whenever you take 3P56 or 3P57. But this all begins by reviewing scholarly literature. So not newspapers, not nonfiction books, not fiction books, but scholarly literature. And not random websites or Wikipedia, oh my God. So, but I'll provide some more guidance as next week progresses. So you're going to use scholarly sources and in particular, you're going to use scholarly journal articles that are empirical. And the week two material on Sakai provides some examples of what that means so that you will differentiate between scholarly empirical research and scholarly conceptual research. So empirical research means that someone has gotten off their backside and gone somewhere and collected some data and, they, and that they've actually left their office. So even if it was just to go pester somebody at Statistics Canada, but often it involves going out and collecting soil samples or interviewing people or collecting advertisements or tracking or catching and uh, marking and tracking wildlife of some sort. So empirical means that 
data was collected and analyzed. And part of why you will be looking at empirical, so scholarly journal articles in particular, is that they provide you, if you will, a set of breadcrumbs or ideas for how to structure your own research. Because in scholarly journal articles, they will talk about how they conducted their research and why they did it and what they found. And those will give you ideas for your literature review, so themes in particular for your literature review, but then it will also help you think about how you would answer somewhat similar questions in Peterborough or in the surrounding area. And a thing to remember is that if you find nothing, you haven't searched long enough. I believe that's true, but also Spickard, bless his soul, says that as well. So keep looking. So, And if you're getting stuck looking, contact me or the TA, or the librarian actually. So, But we can kind of point you in a direction. And the reason that you review your literature is that it reveals if somebody else has answered your research question, and if so, how they went about doing it. And you might think, oh my God, that's terrible. Somebody's already answered my question, uh, but it, which means that I can't answer the question in this particular place. But the cool thing about research is that often people will do similar things in slightly different places and they learn from how other people have answered those particular questions in another location and then they apply that same set of techniques in a new place like Peterborough. So just because someone else has answered your research question, as long as they haven't answered it in Peterborough, in, then you're fine. That's actually how knowledge tends to grow. So because what you can find out is if is your answer similar to someone else's answer and if it is, then that might suggest that there's a more general pattern at work. And if not, that also suggests, so if you find something different, it might suggest that there's different processes at work that cause different kinds of patterns or outcomes in that place you're in. Uh, let's go here. So a literature review reveals what is and is not known about a topic. Keep that in mind. And part of what you do with your research question is that you build on what is known and optimally by building on what is known, you're also able to say something about what is not previously known about whatever it is you're investigating. At the undergraduate level, that's not as important. We're looking basically more so for kind of a competent delivery and clarity. So novelty, so coming up with something completely new, we're not really expecting that. We're just expecting people to do a good job. So hopefully that's helpful. And the last slide is simply this. Research projects can answer one or many research questions. You, my dear friends, should focus on answering one research question, not two or three. So occasionally I've seen people go with two, but that often creates more trouble than it's worth. If you have more than two research questions, pick one you like and go with it. And honestly, just go with one research question. It makes things so much easier. So uh, with that, we are done with the week one lectures as they pertain to the material in Spickard's introduction and chapter one. If you have questions, post to the course forum, and I hope to hear from you sometime soon.